وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته As always we begin with the praise of Allah Azza wa Jal and we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to exalt the mention and grant peace to our Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to his family and his companions. We continue to talk about our children and to talk about the rights that our children have and the obligations that exist for parents towards their children. And we've come to a topic which is probably the biggest topic that we're going to discuss as it relates to the rights of the children and the obligations that are obligations for the parents that they have to do. And this is the topic of At-Tarbiyah. At-Tarbiyah. So because this is such a big topic and it's going to take uh, a number of episodes, inshallah ta'ala, we are going to start by looking at what the word At-Tarbiyah actually means. So the word Tarbiyah in its origin, it comes from the meaning of An-Nama and Az-Ziyadah. Nama wa zad that something increases and that uh, it, it, it is given increase and that it develops. And Allah Azza wa mentioned this linguistic meaning in the Quran, in Surah Al-Hajj, in ayah number 5. فَإِذَا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْهَا الْمَاءَ اَهْتَزَّتْ وَرَبَتْ وَأَنْبَتَتْ مِنْ كُلِّ زَوْجٍ بَهِيجٍ So what we want to focus on here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the word rabat here, from which the word tarbiyah uh, is linked to and comes from, here it means for it to increase and develop and so on. As for tarbiyah in the technical sense of the word, then tarbiyah in the technical sense of the word is to nurture a Muslim and to prepare them in a complete way i.e. to get them ready for their future life in a complete way in every aspect comprising matters of the dunya and the akhirah in the light of Islam and that's a very comprehensive de definition of a tarbiyah and it's a good definition of a tarbiyah that it is to nurture a Muslim and to prepare them for what is to come in a, with a, in a comprehensive way from all of the different aspects for both their worldly life and the life of the hereafter but in the light of Islam so when we talk about tarbiyah in the worldly life tarbiyah in Islam encompasses matters of the worldly life however always in the light of and in the teachings of Islam because ultimately Islam governs how we behave in our worldly life just as it governs how we behave in our religious life and it's not the case that Islam is limited to the matters of religion and worship only. Rather, Islam governs our ibadat and our mu'amalat. It governs our acts of worship and the way that we deal with people and the way that we interact with people. And tarbiyah also has to cover all of those things. And here, that's why we see that tarbiyah is more than just education. Uh, education is ta'lim, teaching the children. But here, tarbiyah is more than that. It is nurturing them and preparing them for all of the aspects of their life, whether they're the aspects of worship, ibadat, or the aspects of their mu'amalat and their dealings with people in the dunya, but in the light of the teachings of the religion of Islam. So it is obviously a huge, huge topic because it covers nurturing, educating, teaching, and bringing up children in a very, very comprehensive way. And from the things that it's worth mentioning here is that from the names of Allah Azza wa Jal is Ar-Rabb. Al-Imam Al-Sa'di, he mentioned that Ar-Rabb huwa al-Murabbi. He is the one who nurtures, he is the nurturer. One of the meanings of the name Ar-Rabb, and Allah is Rabbul Alameen. One of the names, or one of the meanings of the name Ar-Rabb is Al-Murabbi, the nurturer. The one who nurtured all of his servants bit-tadbiri, with by controlling their affairs and, and being in command of them 
and through all of the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them. And he relates this in, in the tafsir of Surah Al-Fatiha, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. We praise Allah Azza wa Jal. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his names, his attributes and his actions. And among those actions, the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us and the decree that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen for us. But all of this relates to the nurturing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nurtures his servants. And he goes on to say, he said, And more specific than that, is that Allah Azza wa Jal nurtures his chosen people. By correcting their hearts and by correcting their souls and their manners. And this, he said, وَلِهَذَا He said, for this reason, the dua of the prophets, والسلام, the dua of the prophets, they frequently mention this name, الرب, Rabbana. All of the duas that start in the Quran, Rabbana, for this reason, because Allah جل, nurtured and He nurtured His, his prophets والسلام, and His messengers by correcting their hearts and their souls and their manners. And likewise, the righteous servants from the slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah جل, blessed them with a portion of that, a part of that, even though the complete blessing of that was for the prophets and the messengers. والسلام, but from in terms of the righteous and the Muslims, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala corrected them to, you know, to an extent, they have a portion of that, that Allah corrected their hearts, their souls, and their manners. And that is why the prophets used to call upon Allah Azza wa Jal, Rabbana, our Lord, because uh, they were asking, لِأَنَّهُمْ يَطْلُبُونَ مِنْهُ التَّرْبِيَةَ الْخَاصَةَ Because they were asking Allah for special nurturing. That's what they were asking Allah for something special, a special kind of nurturing. Allah nurtured all of his slaves. Allah Azza wa Jal nurtured all of his slaves. But the ones that Allah truly blessed are the ones that Allah nurtured upon Iman. And no doubt the prophets and the messengers, they have the biggest portion of that. And that is why Imam Sa'di rahimahullah ta'ala, he said that's why they used to call upon Allah, Rabbana. So if tarbiyah is from the actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala towards his servants, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves for us to do our best with our tarbiyah towards those that we are responsible for. That we try our best to nurture, to educate, to raise our children in the best possible way. And this is a right that our children have over us to the, to the extent that we have the ability to do that to the best of our ability. And it's an obligation upon the parents according to their ability. Allah Azza wa Jal Emphasize this responsibility in Surah Al-Tahreem in ayah number 6. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu ku anfusakum wa ahlikum nara wa quduha al-nasu wal hijara alayha malaikatun ghilaadun shidad la ya'asun Allah ma amarahum wa yaf'aluna ma yu'marun O you who believe, save yourselves and your families from a fire whose fuel is men and storms. Over this fire there are angels who are strong and severe. They do not disobey Allah in what they have been commanded and they do what they have been commanded to do. Allah Azza wa Jal commanded us to save ourselves. Ku anfusakum wa ahlikum and our families. And this is a fundamental uh, principle, this ayah actually is in itself is a fundamental principle in the obligation that we have in nurturing and educating our families. And there are many ways that a person protects their family and first of all they protect themselves but many of them, if not the majority of them, could be classified under the topic of a tarbiyah nurturing, educating and preparing them for the things that they're going to need and here preparing them for the things and giving them the tools that they're going to need to be able to, to gain that protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the fire with the permission of Allah azza wa jal. So that emphasizes the, the obligation of tarbiyah from the view of the parents towards the children, that the parents have to nurture the children in a way that will be a protection for them from the fire with by the permission of Allah azza wa jal. 
And from this is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَاسْطَبِرْ عَلَيْهَا The statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, command your family to perform the prayer and to be regular and, and firm upon doing so. To be patient and consistent in doing so. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ Tell your family to pray. وَاسْتَبِرْ عَلَيْهَا And be regular and patient in performing that prayer. So here we have another ayah which indicates to us the obligation of a person nurturing their children. And here the most important nurturing of your children you're ever going to do is nurturing them to uh, worship Allah Azza wa Jal alone and to leave all those things that are worshipped besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ Command your family to perform the prayer. This is another evidence for the obligation of tarbiyah, the obligation of nurturing them, preparing them and educating them. Because if you are to command them to pray, that necessitates that you have taught them how to pray or you have facilitated them for, to, to learn how to pray and to perform the prayer in the way that Allah Azza wa legislated for them to do so. And then you command them to perform the prayer وَاسْتَبِرْ And you yourself, you remain consistent and patient upon doing so. And Allah Azza wa Jal said in Surah An-Nisa, يُصِيكُمُ اللَّهُ فِي أَوْلَادِكُمْ Allah Azza wa Jal uh, mentioned this ayah in, or the beginning of this ayah, in relation to the inheritance. Uh, Allah Azza wa Jal said, يُصِيكُمُ اللَّهُ فِي أَوْلَادِكُمْ لِلذَّكَرِ مِثْلُ حَظِّ الْأُنْثَيَيْنِ To the end of the ayah, that the male child has twice that of the female child. So why did we bring this ayah? when Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned it in the context of uh, inheritance. Because ultimately the word you will see kumullah, it means ahida ilaykum as Ibn Jarir rahimullah ta'ala mentioned in his tafsir. It means that Allah has taken a covenant with you in relation to your children. And yes, that is in the context of inheritance, but it's also in the wider context that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken a covenant has taken a promise from you, an agreement from you as it relates to your children. So you have that right or you have that, they have that right over you and you have those obligations towards them. And it's an act, it's a promise and a covenant that you have been, that has been put upon you and imposed upon you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. يُسِيكُمُ اللَّهُ فِي أَوْلَادِكُمْ Allah Azza wa Jal has taken a covenant from you with regard to your children in regard to filling their rights, of which tarbiyah and nurturing them and educating them and preparing them for their acts of worship and for their dealings in the worldly life, that this is no doubt from the greatest of this covenant, from the greatest of this act, of this covenant and this agreement that is between you and Allah as it relates to your children. And Abi Hurairah radiallahu an narrated, and he used to say, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَا مِنْ مَوْلُودٍ إِلَّا يُولَدُ عَلَى الْفِطْرَةِ There is no child except that child is born in a natural state upon the fitrah. And the fitrah, the natural state, is the natural state to inclination to worship Allah azza wa jal alone. They, at that point, they don't know about the Qur'an. They don't know about the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But they are in an, a state which is conducive it's natural for them to go into Islam and to worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal. فَأَبَوَاهُ يُهَوِّدَانِهِ أَوْ يُنَصِّرَانِهِ أَوْ يُمَجِّسَانِهِ But it is their parents that turn them into a Jew or a Christian or a Magian. It's not the child who is born and says, I want to be a Christian. Or it's not the child who is born uh, with a Christian cross in their hands. Rather, it's the parents who do that to them. The, the child is born naturally and given the right upbringing and the right tarbiyah, and this is why we brought this hadith here, given the right tarbiyah, there is no reason why with the permission of Allah and his tawfiq, that child should not grow up to be a practicing Muslim. Because the child naturally is inclined towards that. They're inclined towards it. They're, they have an inclination away from, uh, away from making a partner with Allah. They're, not, they're disinclined towards making a partner with Allah Azza wa Jal. It's not, it's not natural. But it's the parents and their tarbiyah that turns that child into a Jew or a Christian or a Majin. And the Prophet ﷺ, he gave an example. كَمَا تُنْتَجُ الْبَهِيمَةُ بَهِيمَةً جَمْعًا حَلْ تُحِسُّونَ فِيهَا مِنْ جَدْعًا 
like the animal from among the cattle that gives birth to its offspring and it is completely healthy and completely wholesome and pure. Do you see that its ear has been slit? Min jad'a and this is the something that the the Arabs in the time of Jahiliyyah from the evil beliefs that they had and the evil laws that they had and making haram and making halal what Allah Azza wa made haram and so on that they used to slit the ears of the cattle and this was from the effects that the shaitan whispered to them and the shaitan encouraged them to do but the point is that this belief of theirs when the camel they, they used to disfigure the cattle the cattle were disfigured like that was that cattle born disfigured or was it them that came and they disfigured that, cat, that, that animal. In reality, it was they who came and disfigured the animal. The animal was born without any of this disfigurement and without any of these false beliefs that they had. The animal was born pure. The animal was born healthy, but it's they who corrupted it. And that is the example the Prophet ﷺ gave of the parent and the tarbiyah of the parent. And this hadith is one of the most powerful ahadith as it relates to the topic of tarbiyah. Because if you look at the the, the context of the hadith is that that child is ready for tarbiyah. That child is ready to be brought up as a Muslim and they have every characteristic from their fitrah, from their natural inclination, which is there that has been given to them by Allah Azza wa Jal. They are ready for the tarbiyah of their parents to, to bring them into Islam. And if you give them the right tarbiyah, they will embrace Islam by the permission of Allah Azza wa Jal and, and Allah's tawfiq, they will embrace Islam. It's natural for them. However, it is the parent in the first instance. And we're not going to say the child can't go astray after that. Examples from uh, the prophets and the messengers, alayhim salatu wassalam, the son of Nuh, alayhi salam, and so on. But we're not going to say a child cannot go astray after that. But we're going to say that in the first instance, when that child is born, that child is not born a Christian. That child is not born a Jew. That child is not born in another religion. That child is born with every everything is conducive for them to become a Muslim. But what is needed is the tarbiyah of the parents. The parents to nurture them upon that path. And what happens after that is in the hands of Allah Azza wa Jal. And that's why Abu Huraira, he said in this hadith, ثُمَّ يَقُولُ Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira, he said in this hadith, he said, وَقْرَأُوا إِنْ شِئْتُمْ He said, recite if you wish. And it's from the statement of Abu Huraira that he said, he's bringing you an ayah to show to you this ayah is linked to the hadith or that this ayah, uh, the hadith is an explanation of this ayah or that this ayah further in emphasizes what is mentioned in the hadith. And this is from the statement of Abi Huraira that he said, وَقْرَأُوا إِنْ شِئْتُمْ Recite if you wish. فِطَرَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي فَطَرَ النَّاسَ عَلَيْهَا لَا تَبَدِيلَ لِخَلْقِ اللَّهِ الْآيَةِ The fitra of Allah that Allah Azza wa Jal created the people upon. There is no replacement for the creation of Allah. Allah Azza wa Jal created people, created our children ready to accept this tarbiyah. And really it's our responsibility as parents. It's our obligation as parents. It's their right upon us that we give them that start. And as we said, the aqibah, the end result, what will happen in the end, no one knows that except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَا يَعْلَمُ تَأْوِيلَهُ إِلَى الله. No one knows how things will end except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nobody knows that except Allah. But that child is born in a situation and a state that is conducive to the tarbiyah of Islam. If you give them that tarbiyah, you have the, the best opportunity with the permission of Allah for that child to grow up as a righteous Muslim. And if that child is given that false tarbiyah, tarbiyah upon other religions and other beliefs and false ideologies, when they are so young, look at the danger for that child. That child turns into a Jew or a Christian or a mage. And we said, Allah will never punish a people until he sends them a messenger. Everyone will have a chance. Everyone will have an opportunity. And your Lord will not oppress anyone. Everyone will have an opportunity. But look at the start. The parent has the ability to give the child that start. They're born ready for this tarbiyah. And the parent giving them that tarbiyah gives them the best start in life rather than the parent who brings their child up as a Jew or a Christian or any other religion other than that. And then the child has to find their own way and has to struggle with that false tarbiyah that the parent has given them, which goes against their natural inclinations and it goes against the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created them. 
And as we said, this doesn't mean that every child that has that tarbiya will necessarily uh, will necessarily uh, end among the people of Jannah. Nor does it mean that if the child doesn't have that tarbiya in the beginning, that they're condemned to the fire. And from the evidences for this is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal: "Yukhriju al-hayya min al-mayyit, wa yukhriju al-mayyita min al-hayy." That Allah Azza wa Jal brings the dead out, the living out from the dead, and the dead out from the living. Some of the scholars they mention in the tafsir of this that Allah Azza wa Jal brings out the living from the dead. That Allah Azza wa Jal brings out the Muslim from the non-Muslim parents. And the example they gave is the example of Ikrima ibn Abi Jahl, radiyallahu an. That Ikrima, the son of Abu Jahl, he was from the from the noble Sahaba of the, the the noble companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And look at how Allah Azza wa Jal brought out Ikrima, the one who was alive from the Mayyit, who was Abu Jahl, who there is no good in him and nothing good in him at all. And Allah Azza wa Jal spoke about the evil that he did and the evil of him. And Allah Azza wa Jal said, "Kalla la illam yantahi la nasfa'an bin nasiyah, nasiyatin kathibatin khati'ah." That if he doesn't stop preventing the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam or threatening the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam regarding his prayer in the Kaaba, we're going to seize him by his forelock, a forelock which is, or that he is, a, he is a lying and sinful. I mean, the, 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 the person of who has that forelock is lying and sinful. Look at that description of Abu Jahl. And then look what came from Abu Jahl. Ikrimah radiyallahu anhu wa arda. The same on the other example. وَيُخْرِجُ الْمَيِّتَ مِنَ الْحَيِّ That Allah Azza wa Jal brings out the dead from the living. Look at the example of the son of Nuh alayhi salam and that the son of Nuh uh, and Nuh alayhi salam who was from the most beloved of the, the prophets and the messengers to Allah Azza wa Jal from Ulul Azmi min al-Rusul, the five most important and the five most dedicated among the messengers uh, alayhi salatu was salam and yet his son did not uh, accept Islam and was not uh, a Muslim and his son disobeyed him in, as is well known from the, the ayat which uh, uh, which speak about this so ultimately we, we're not, we, we want people to understand that we're not condemning someone and saying that if your parent didn't give you that tarbiyah from the first day that you were born you're condemned to the fire and nor are we saying that if the parent gives them the tarbiyah that they're guaranteed Jannah. But there's no doubt that the best thing you can do for your child as a Muslim is to take that natural inclination to worship Allah and to nurture it and to develop it and to ask Allah and make dua to Allah as we've said for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to give you the tawfiq for that to have a lasting example. So I'm going to conclude this episode here, insha'Allah ta'ala, because what we have coming in the next episode is we want to give some examples of the tarbiyah that the pious predecessors and the, the prophets, the messengers and the righteous people, alayhim salatu wassalam, and they, that they gave to their children. And we want to talk about some examples of that that are mentioned in the Quran, insha'Allah. And that's also a big topic. So we're going to, we're going to dedicate a, an episode uh, at least one episode inshallah ta'ala to that and that's going to come up next so we will finish our episode there and Allah azza wa jalla knows best was salatu was salam ala nabiyyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in assalamu alaykum if you're enjoying these videos and you'd like to keep up to date with all of the courses we're going to be running make sure you head over to amauathome.com